Okay, good. Hey, everybody. Hope you had a good, beautiful Christmas and a happy new year. We had a little pause, but we're now back in action here. And I hope you're healthy and well. There's a, as you know, COVID seems to be rearing its ugly head again, and we have some people affected by it. Uh, my voice is not what it used to be, a little hoarse, but it's not COVID. I have the sinus condition and the tripping, a little infection that way, but otherwise I'm doing all right. Just a little bit tired, but anyway, good, but hope you're well. So as we look forward to this coming Sunday on the 8th is the Feast of the, uh, the Epiphany, which also close out our Christmas season. Monday is the baptism of our Lord. So uh, we're going to get a chance to enjoy the Christmas decorations enough. It just seems awfully quick. But let's look at our gospel, Matthew chapter 2, 1 through, 1 through 12. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, Herod behold, Magi from the east, arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star at its rising, and had come to do him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was greatly troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where, where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it has been written through the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, since from you shall come a ruler who is to be shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and ascertained from them the time of the star's appearance. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word that I too may go and do him homage. After their audience with their king, they set out. And behold, the star they had seen at its rising preceded them until it came and stepped over the place where the child was. They were overjoyed at seeing the star, and on entering the house, they saw the child with, where the child was. And they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They prostrated themselves and did him homage. They opened their treasures and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for the country by another way. So it was Bethlehem, as we know, that Jesus was born. Bethlehem was quite a little town, six miles south of Jerusalem. In the olden days, it's been called Ephrath, Ephrath or Ephratha, and the name Bethlehem means the house of bread. You hear many priests and comment on Bethlehem being the house of bread, Mass, the Eucharist, and Jesus was laying in a manger, manger from the uh, Latin and Italian, mangiare, to eat. So in a sense, Jesus gave himself to be to be food and nourish for us, as we Catholics know them in the Holy Eucharist. Hmm? And the house of bread, or Bethlehem, was stood in a fertile countryside, <coughs> which made it a very fitting name. It stood up on high gray limestone ridge with more than 2,500 feet in height. The ridge had a summit at each end as an, and a hollow like a saddle between them. So from its position, position Bethlehem looked like a town set in an amphitheater of hills. <coughs> Maybe sort of fitting an amphitheater, for this is the great production, right? The greatest show, Jesus being born. Bethlehem had a long history. Jacob buried his wife, Rachel, there, and set up a pillar in memory of her beside her grave. It was there that Ruth had lived and married Boaz from Bethlehem, and Ruth could see the land of Moab, her native land across the Jordan Valley. But Bethlehem, is the city of David. And it's from the water of the well of Bethlehem that David longed when he was hunted fugitive up the hills, the city of David. Anyway, we see Justin the Martyr speak very highly of this place. Mm -hmm. The prophet Micah, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, from the, you are among the clans of Judah, and go forth one as be the ruler of Israel. And Justin the Martyr, I think, lived in the, about 180. 150 A.D., who came from the district of Bethlehem, tells Jesus was born in a cave. I know we always have the manger scene, but probably more like it was a cave, especially thinking about the terrain. And the house of Bethlehem was built on a slope of limestone ridge, so it would make sense, probably that he was more in a cave than actually what we could, a little manger that we, we create. And to this day, a cave, you go to, go to Bethlehem, the city, the birthplace of Jesus is shown in the church of nativity, which is above the cave. For very long, the cave has been shown as the birthplace of our Lord. 
And it was the days of the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Hadrian, a deliberate attempt to desecrate the place, erected a shrine to the heathen god of Adonis above it. When the Roman Emperor became Christian, however, in the fourth century, Constantine, the first Christian Emperor, Constantine, built a great church there. And that church might be but restored and still stands. Imagine, put a the pagan god and said, Constantine, that God bless him. No, no, made a really fitting place. Now we have the Magi. They were originally a Median, tri Median tribe. The Medes were part of the empire of the Persians. They tried to overthrow the Persians and substitute the power of the Medes. The attempt failed from that time. The Magi ceased to have any ambitions for power or prestige. They became a tribe of priests. They became in Persia almost exactly what the Levites were in Israel. They became the teachers and structures of the Persian kings. So in Persia, no sacrifice could be offered unless one of the Magi was present. They became men of holiness and wisdom. The Magi were men who were skilled in philosophy, medicine, and, and natural science. In those ancient days, all men believed in astrology, and I hope none of you do, but some too, but still today, but... They believed they could tell the future from the stars, that they believed a man's destiny was settled by the star in which he was born. The stars pursue the universe on varying courses. They represent the order of the universe. So then there suddenly appeared some brilliant star. If the unvarying order of the heavens were broken by some special phenomenon, it did look as God was breaking into his order and announcing some special thing. So something irregular happens, uh-oh, God is telling us something. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't know what brilliant star the Magi saw. Many suggest, perhaps, that maybe Hades Comet could have been shooting across the sky, or, or that in 7 BC there was a brilliant conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. Who knows? Hmm? But it was the Magi's job to watch the sky and follow the stars. Now, at the most same time as Jesus was born, we find Augustus, the Roman emperor, being healed as the savior of the world. So we call Jesus the savior. Now we have Augustus, all right? He's being healed. Mm -hmm. And the Roman poet Virgil, sort of known, declared this period as the messianic ecologue, the golden days to come. So now we have this diversity, the, the pagan, not the ruler, or Jesus, the son of God. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at Herod. Now, Herod was an interesting man. He, um, he was a ruler of Palestine, succeeding in keeping peace and bringing order to disorder. He was a great builder, Herod. He was indeed the builder of the temple in Jerusalem. He could be generous. In times of difficulty, he remitted the taxes to make things easier for the people. And in the famine 25 BC, he had actually melted down his own gold plate to buy corn for the starving people. Sounds pretty like a decent fella, even more than, better than decent. But, as all of us, he had his flaws, and in this case, he had an extreme flaw. He was insanely suspicious. He had always been suspicious, and the older he became, the more suspicious he grew until his old age. As someone said, a murderous old man. If he suspected anyone as a rival to his power, that person was promptly eliminated. He murdered his wife, Mary, Miriam, and his own mother, Alexandra, his eldest son, and two other sons, Alexander and Aristobulus, all were assassinated by him. Augustus, the Roman emperor, had, had said bitterly that it was safer to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. So you see, this guy is, uh, he may show signs of generosity, but his, his desire and need to be in power and feeling threatened. Can you imagine killing your wife, your own mother, and your own children? This is the kind of person he was. Mm -hmm. And so the news reached about the child being born, and all of a sudden now he's nervous. It sounds like he's interested in seeing, paying respects, paying honor, but that's not his purpose. And we see later the, the killing of the, of the unborn, the magi, of the, of the, of the children, excuse me. Hmm? Innocence. And so this is the, what Jesus is being born into. A different time. So we have the Magi come. <coughs> now, legend gives them names, but we don't know their names. We don't know if there's three. Can we just say three because of the three gifts? But we give names, Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar, and they give their gifts. <coughs> <coughs> Four, 
Frankincense is a gift for a gold is a gift for a king, of course, and frankincense is a gift for the priest. It was a fit in the temple worship and the temple sacrifice, a sweet perfume, the frankincense was used. And myrrh <coughs> is a gift for one who dies. Myrrh was used to embalm the bodies of the dead. <coughs> so we have all three, the priest, the gold for the king, and it's Jesus who came to die for us. So may we pray in this Feast of Epiphany with all this entanglement, all the web we have here, may we come to see Jesus, who is the light, not be threatened, but we may surrender to him, his lordship, <coughs> and do what he asks of us. God bless you.